All right. How's everybody out there this morning? Hope you're doing good. Hope your morning is going okay. Hope you had a good holiday yesterday for those of you who were off. I know everybody wasn't off yesterday. Uh, some people were. So I hope you had a good off day yesterday. I got a question this morning that I'm answering from uh, one of my followers. And and I think this may have come from a, uh, a lesson or something that I did previously. But the question is, do we live under the Old or the New Testament? And we, we kind of had a conversation going back and forth. And she said uh, that she thought that, excuse me, that I believe that we only live under the New Testament and that we don't live under the Old Testament. That is a that that question is not as easy as we may make it. It, it is a complicated question <clears throat> in one sense, and in one sense, it's a simple question. What makes it complicated is the use of terminology. The use of terminology. If you say in the 21st century that I, that we do not live by the Old Testament, this is my old sorry, sorry about that, I got a phone call. If you say in the 21st century that we do not live by the Old Testament, in my opinion, that is so misleading. Uh, in my opinion, to say we don't live by the Old Testament is, 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 is ambiguous. There's not enough information there. And, and, and here's why I say that. In our day and time, when people think about the Testaments, when they think about Old and New Testament, here's what they think about. Let me, let me show you exactly what they think about. In the front of this Bible right here, it says the Holy Bible, giant print edition, containing the Old and New Testaments. Okay? And so when we open it up, let me show you what we have. When we open it up, Notice what that says, Old Testament. And it goes all the way to Malachi. And so when you get to the book of Matthew, let me show you what it says. When you get to the book of Matthew, it says New Testament. So according to this Bible right here, the Old Testament goes from Genesis to Malachi. And the New Testament starts at Matthew and goes to Revelation. That's what, that's what most people understand the word testament to mean. When you say Old Testament, people are thinking about the books of the Bible from Genesis to Malachi. When you say New Testament, people are thinking about the books of the Bible from Matthew to Revelation. So to make a statement to say, that says that we don't live by the Old Testament without explanation is misleading. So when someone asks me, do we live by the Old Testament? Here's what I ask. What do you mean, Old Testament? It's important to explain to people what you mean by Testament. Okay? Because in their mind, once again, they may not be thinking like you. We live by the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible, and that that needs to be understood. Oh, it needs to be understood. We live by the entire Bible, y'all. Our lives are guided by the entire Bible, but we don't live under every law in the Bible. Okay. We live by the entire Bible, but we don't live under every law in the Bible. Every warning in the Bible does not apply to us. Every promise in the Bible does not apply to us. Every consequence that's mentioned in the Bible does not apply to us. Some things do. We live under one law, the law of Christ, and I'll show you that in just a minute, but there are warnings throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament that apply to us. There are promises throughout the Bible, Old Testament and the New Testament that apply to us. 
And there are consequences in the Bible, Old Testament and the New Testament, that apply to us. We have to figure out what things apply to us and what things don't. So let's, let's sear it in our minds that we live by the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. The only difference is everything in the Bible does not apply to us. That's important, y'all. Okay? I still raise my children up based upon Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6, which says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he would not depart from it. Okay? I still live by Psalms 23, and it gives me encouragement, which says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I still live by the promise that God made to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, when he said, Noah, I flooded this earth, but the but I'm going to make a promise to you and to your children and to every generation that follows. All As long as this earth stands, I'm going to put a rainbow in the cloud. And every individual who looks at that rainbow and sees that rainbow will remember my promise that I have made to mankind that I will never again destroy this earth by water. That promise that comes from the Old Testament still applies to you and I. Okay? So the word testament has two different meanings for people. I'm not talking about biblical meaning. I'm talking about for people. The word testament for people can mean, I mean, it means the books of the Bible, Old and New Testament. Or it may mean the laws of the Bible, Old Testament law of Moses, Old Testament law of Christ. Now, if you mean by that question, do we live by the books of the Bible in the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, the answer is yes. We live by the entire Bible, entire books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. If you mean by the question, do we live under the Old Testament, if you mean by that, do we live under the, the law, the covenant, which is what the word testament means, it means covenant. If you mean by that, do we live under the law of Moses, then it takes a completely different turn. And that's where my answer comes from, yes and no. Do we live by the Old Testament? Yes and no. The first answer, yes, if you mean by that books of the Bible. The second answer, no, if you mean by that the law of Moses. Okay? So let's look at that now. Let's look at the law of Moses and, uh, and, 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 uh, and see, do we live under the Old Testament in the sense of it being a law? Okay? All right, in, in, back in the Old Testament, God gave a law to the children, children of Israel. It was, it was the Ten Commandments, it, but it wasn't just the Ten Commandments. It was the, um, uh, all the ceremonial laws, the laws of sacrifice and stuff like that. God gave these laws to Moses. Moses gave these laws to the children of Israel. Okay, And it was only to last for a temporary time. Okay, it was only to be temporary. And the reason we know that is because in Jeremiah chapter 31, <clears throat> here's a prophecy that God was going to establish a new testament, a new covenant, a new law. Listen to this very, listen to this very carefully. In Jeremiah 31 and verse number 31, notice what God told Israel. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. That's a testament. That's what the word testament means. I will make a new testament or a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant or the testament I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So what covenant did God make with Israel when he led them out of Egypt and took them by the hand? The covenant at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and all things that go with the Ten Commandments. God said, I'm going to make a new testament or new covenant with them. And it's not going to be like the testament or the covenant that I made with them at Mount Sinai. It's going to be different than that. Okay? All right? So what God was speaking of was he was going to remove the law of Moses. He was going to remove the old covenant, the Old Testament law of Moses. He was going to take it out of the way, and he was going to uh, reestablish a new covenant, and that covenant would be the law of Christ the New Testament or the New Covenant. And what I want to do is I want to show you in the New Testament from the book of Galatians that the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments were never, ever, 
supposed to have been permanent. They were never, ever supposed to have been around for a long period of time. Okay, we, we made them stay around longer than God intended for them to stay around. But in Galatians chapter 3, I want us to look at uh, verse number 23. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Listen to this very, very carefully. Okay. Before faith came, we were kept guard by the law. Okay. Kept for the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. So what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was to take the children of Israel by the hand like a teacher, okay, uh, like a supervisor, guardian. The law took the children of Israel by the hand to lead them to Jesus, okay? That was its purpose. That was its design, okay? Why? In the same verse it says, so that we might be justified by faith, okay? The law of Moses took the children of Israel and led them to Jesus. Why? So they could be justified by faith, which means this right here. Under the law of Moses, they could not be justified by faith, which was one of its weaknesses. That's why it was temporary. That's why God had to get rid of it. And that's why God had to uh, move it out of the way. Its purpose was to bring the people to Jesus so that they could be justified by faith. Now look at verse 25. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, or we are no longer under the law. Okay, that's important. The, we were under the Paul said the Jews were under the law until they came to Christ. But once Christ came on the scene, they were no longer under a tutor. There was no longer need for the law because Christ was there. They now had the the, uh, the ability to be justified by their faith. And that's important. Okay? So the law served its purpose. The Ten Commandments served their purpose. Many people feel that if you say we don't live by the law of Moses anymore, or the Old Covenant, or the Old Testament, remember once again now, Testament can be used in two ways. Books of the Bible, which we do follow, or it can be referred to as a law, which we don't follow all the laws. We live now under the law of Christ. We live by uh, the law of the New Covenant and the New Testament. Okay, But many people feel like that if you say we don't live by the law of Moses, we don't live by the Ten Commandments, that you're somehow disrespecting God or you're somehow uh, uh, pushing aside God's commandments to kill and not to kill and stuff like that. And that's just not true. Any of the laws contained in the Ten Commandments that God wanted us to keep and wanted us to follow he brought over into the New Testament law of Christ. Okay? The ones he didn't want us to follow or bring over, he left them back there. Such laws as uh, assembling on the Sabbath day or the Saturday or Saturday to worship God. But everything that you can find in the Ten Commandments when it comes to morality, Jesus brought over into his law, the New Covenant. You should actually be glad that the law of Moses is not still around anymore. You should actually be glad that the Ten Commandments are not still around anymore because if the Ten Commandments were still around, then anybody trying to follow God would not have life. Anybody following God would not have forgiveness. The Apostle Paul was talking about the law. And, and notice what Paul said about the law in Romans chapter 7. Paul said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except it was from the law, except through the law. Paul said the law of Moses identified sin for him. The law of Moses told him what sin was. And that's the problem. The only thing the law of Moses could do was point out the sin. It couldn't get rid of the sin. It couldn't correct your situation. The only thing the law of Moses could do was show you where you're wrong, but it could not make you right. And in Romans chapter 7 and verse number 7, Paul said, I would not have known what covetousness was, except the law said you shall not covet. But here's the problem. Look at verse 8. But sin, taking an opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which I thought to bring light, it brought death. Paul said the Ten Commandments brought death. Paul said, yes, it was instructional. Paul said, yes, it gave me the knowledge of sin. 
But Paul said, I lived my life once without the law and I was okay. But as soon as the Ten Commandments came into my life, it identified my wrong. It identified my sin, but it couldn't get rid of them. And so when I once was alive without the law, the law came, then I died. Why? Because he had nothing to get rid of the sin in his life. The law of Moses couldn't do that. The Ten Commandments could not get rid of sin. It could only point out sin. And that's why the same apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 called the law administration of death. Ministry of death. Notice this very carefully. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse number 6. God made us sufficient ministers of the new covenant, the New Testament. Not of the letter, that's the Old Testament, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, the Ten Commandments, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Okay? But if the ministry of death, notice, the Ten Commandments were called a ministry of death. If the ministry of death written and engraven on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly on the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? You see that? Paul said the law that was written on tablets of stone was a ministry of death. The Ten Commandments were a ministry of death. Why? Because they could only point out sin. They could not get rid of sin. That's one of the reasons God had to take the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament law, the law, not the books of the Bible. Remember, Testament can refer to two things. According to this book that we call a Bible, it's been separated into Testaments. Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. New Testament, Matthew to Revelation. We're not talking about that. We live by the entire Bible. We live by every book of the Bible, Genesis to Malachi, but we don't live by every law in the Bible. Okay? So there are two ways to look at the word testament. Right now, I'm not looking at testament from the perspective of the books of the Bible. I'm looking at testament from the perspective of the law, the covenant. Okay? We don't live by every covenant in the Bible. We only live by the covenant of Christ, the new covenant, the new testament. Okay? So you may ask this question here. When did God take the old covenant out of the way? When did he get rid of it? Now, I may disagree with some of my brethren on this point, but I still don't think it's a big deal because as long as we agree that God did take the law of Moses out of the way, that's all that matters. I think it was a process that God was going through to remove the law of Moses, and I think that process began at the cross. Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 14, says this right here. Having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he taken it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. So God began nailing the law. I mean, he took the cross out of the way by beginning, uh, the law out of the way by beginning at the cross. He nailed it to the cross. Well, you may say, well, Tony, that simply says the law was done with at the cross. Yes, it was done with at the cross. It was. But God still allowed some people to live by the law of Moses even after the cross. I mean, could you imagine God completely getting rid of the law when people hadn't even heard the gospel yet? What would they have to judge the lives? Okay? And that's why I believe the interpretation of Hebrews chapter 8, it, it, it is what it says. I've read some, some people's opinion about Hebrews chapter 8, and I, I, I disagree with some of them, uh, but I believe Hebrews chapter 8 coincides with the idea that God, it was a process to remove the law. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 13, uh, we find uh, about the Testament, the covenant. The Hebrew writer says this, and that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now notice, when the Hebrew writer wrote, God had already made the old law, the, the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses, obsolete. So there was no point to it anymore. It was obsolete. But notice what he goes on to say. Now what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. Why did he say it's growing old and is ready to vanish away way after the cross? Because I believe it was a process. Okay? It had to be a process because if it wasn't a process, then the Apostle Paul would have been guilty of living by the law of Moses. 
Did you all know that in the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul on one occasion actually did uh, live by the law of Moses in order to try to, let, let me just read it to you and show, show you what it says. Here's the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. And, uh, and this entire story here is, is, is so interesting, especially when it comes to what Paul did. Okay, We're, we're told we cannot live by the law of Moses. We cannot live by, the, uh, by the, uh, the Old Testament law after it had been nailed to the cross. But notice this right here. Let me start at verse number uh, 17, Acts chapter 21. And it says, we had come to Jerusalem, and the brethren received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James and to the elders that were present. And when we had greeted them, he told us the details of the things that God had done among the Gentiles. And when they heard it, they glorified God. Okay, verse number 21. But they were informed about you that you teach the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. So Paul said, these people heard that you all are teaching that they should forsake Moses. Okay. And that they shouldn't circumcise their children and so forth. And notice what they say in verse 24. Take them, purify them, with, uh, purify them, pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and so that all may know that the things of which they have been informed concerning you, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. What? What? These people were instructed to keep the law. These people were instructed to keep the law. I, I, I heard somebody say one time that the only reason they were told to do this is so they can win some people. Okay. So are you saying to me that in our day and time, it's okay to keep the law just so we can win people? It's okay to te keep the Old Testament law of Moses so we can win people? No. You, you, we can't keep the law. The only reason... Paul, them were permitted to do this is because the, the law of Moses had not been completely removed out of the way yet. It was a process going on. It would be removed out of the way eventually once the gospel had reached everybody. Okay? And, and Stephen told these people in the book of Acts when that was going to happen. In Acts chapter 7. Let's look at Acts chapter 7. And verse number, uh, Acts chapter 6. This is when Stephen was getting ready to be stoned. And the reason Stephen was going to be stoned is because he was teaching that God was going to remove and completely destroy the idea and the concept of Moses and the law. Okay? So in Acts chapter 6, verse 13, they set up false witnesses and said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words, notice, against this holy place, and the law. They were talking about the temple. They said Stephen is preaching against the temple and against the law. You see, in a Jew's mind, as long as the temple stood, the law stood. As long as the temple stood, God was still on their side. As long as the temple stood, Moses stood. As long as the temple stood, the customs of Moses stood. So yes, even though the law was nailed to the cross, in the minds of these people here, the law was still in effect because the symbol of the law was still around. That glorious temple. Oh boy, they love that thing. So in chapter 14, they said, we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy this place and change, notice, change the customs which Moses delivered to us. You notice what, preach, what Stephen was preaching? Stephen was preaching that when, when God removed and destroyed the temple, at that moment, he would change completely the customs of Moses. So the process of the removal of the law began at the cross and was completely and utterly demolished when the temple was removed. Technically speaking, the law was finished at the cross. It was done. God was through with it. Okay, there was no point to it anymore. Practically speaking, in the mind of the people who followed God, the law was still in existence as long as the temple was still there. 
Okay, this is what made the destruction of Jerusalem so powerful in the Old Testament when the children of Israel went into captivity for 70 years. Could you imagine them going into captivity and the temple remaining, Jerusalem remaining? They would think that God was still on their side. One of the proofs that God had forsaken them in the Old Testament when they went into captivity for 70 years was he destroyed Jerusalem, he destroyed the temple, he tore down the wall. Then they knew that their relationship with God was severed. Well, this was the only way that God was going to show these people that the Ten Commandments are no longer viable, the Law of Moses is no longer viable, and you cannot any longer live by the Old Covenant or the Old Testament Law. And God said, I'm going to show you this because I'm going to destroy every memory of the Law of Moses that you have, beginning with the Temple, beginning with Jerusalem, and beginning with the Wall. And God did that. And because God took strong measures to remove the Temple and to destroy Jerusalem, He he let every Jew living know that I am through with the Old Covenant Law. I'm through with the Old Testament Law. I'm through with the Law of Moses. The only law that stands now that we live under is the Law of Christ, and that'll be the law that we live under until we're judged. Okay? And that's important for us to understand. So, what I believe the misunderstanding has been is how we use terminology. It's just like church. Man, do you know how many different ways people use church? They use church to refer to the church building. Uh, they use church to refer to the church services. They use church to refer to the people. Now, there's only one Bible way that the word church is used, and the word church in the Bible is used to refer to those who've been called out of the darkness into light. But in our day and time, the word church is used totally different. So I think it's very, very important that sometimes we stop and consider what a person may mean by a question before we just jump off and answer the question. Because we may actually be saying something that we don't intend to say based upon how a person is perceiving the definition of a word. So when somebody asks me, do we live under the Old Testament or the New Testament? My question automatically is, well, what do you mean by testament? Do you mean the books of the Bible? Well, if that's what you mean, yes, we live by all the books of the Bible. Or do you mean by the law, the Old Covenant law, the New Testament law? Well, if that's what you mean, then no, we don't live by the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. We live by the New Covenant, the New Testament of Christ. Y'all, this has been the most consistent way for me to understand the concept of the laws, the concept of the Testament, and I hadn't always looked at it this way, but I'm a big believer in trying to be as consistent as I am and trying to make the explanation of God's word so simple for people that there's really no way for them to miss the point. I used to hear people say all the time, oh, y'all don't believe in the Old Testament. I never for the life of me could figure out why people said that. I couldn't figure out why people said y'all don't believe in the Old Testament. Until I stopped for a minute and started trying to think like people. And I said, wow. Now I understand why people feel that way. Now I understand. Now I understand for the first time why people said we don't live by the Old Testament. And it's simply because I was not explaining clear enough what I mean by testament. What I mean by testament. I hope, I, you know, for those of you who just were able to tune in or halfway through, go back and watch the, the, the whole video because I'm telling you, you're not going to get an explanation of what I'm saying unless you watch the whole video. Okay, if you watch half of the video or a third of the video and think you got a clear explanation of what I said, you, you don't. Trust me, you do not. You got to watch the entire video in order to get an explanation of what I said. Okay? Um, so... I hope it was clear for those of you who have been able to tune in the whole time. I hope this was simple. I hope it was clear to you. If I said something that you need clarification on or you disagree with just a little bit, hey, feel free to, uh, in our last few minutes, feel free to let me know. And I'll be, I'll be glad to explain to you a little bit more why or how I came to the conclusion I came to. I'll be happy to. That's what, hey, that's what Bible study is all about. I believe Bible study should be us discussing the Word of God, even in our disagreements, trying to figure out where we're missing it. You trying to help me, and I'm trying to help you. 
A Bible study should never be about us arguing, about us feeling like the other person doesn't know what they're talking about, or feeling like I'm right or you're wrong. We're working together trying to figure this out so we all can come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what Bible study should be about. And that's why I don't mind you, 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 you expressing your uh, opinion or your disagreement or just have some basis for it, you know, some scriptural basis for uh, your angle so I can kind of see what, how did you come to your conclusion. So just take this time, you know, if anybody have a question or, or anything, come in, just feel free to uh, let me know, and I'll be glad to look at it. not then um that's that's all i got for us this morning uh, i'll be back tomorrow lord willing at 9 a.m and i'll be looking unless i get another question or something i'll be looking with some issues that, that deal with uh, life how we uh, uh how we live every day and uh some of the things that we face in our daily lives and how to deal with them All right, then. I guess I'll close it out with some Hall and Oates, then. Can't go for that. Look, y'all have a great day. I appreciate y'all every every morning that I'm on for tuning in. I really do. You all don't know how much, because I know you could be doing something else. And so I appreciate you. I appreciate your kind comments, inboxes, and all of that. Y'all have a blessed day. I'll be praying for your family as you pray for my family. As well, if you got a subject or something that you want me to talk about, put it in the comment section or send me an inbox, and I'll be happy to uh, talk about it with you. Roll tile, y'all have a great day. Peace out.